tupton's trial by anna harriet leon owens this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard tupton's trial by anna harriet leon owens about seven o'clock on the following morning i was in the sala or san juan which is within the second enclosure of the palace but outside of the third or inner wall which is that of the harem this building is of one story only and totally unlike that occupied for similar purposes in the interior of the grand palace the main entrance was through a long low corridor on both sides of which opened apartments of different dimensions so dilapidated as to be scarcely habitable looking out upon the barracks the magazine and the fantastic grounds of the palace gardens on entering the hall one was at once struck by the incongruities that met the eye the windows were large and lofty and might have served for the casements of a royal residence while the doors were very narrow and mean and the floor merely a collection of worm-eaten boards roughly nailed down one interesting and picturesque peculiarity was the monstrous size of the spiders who must have had undisturbed possession of the walls and ceiling for at least a century altogether it was very dark dull and dreary even depressing and sepulchral when not illumined by the direct rays of the sun several of the men and women judges were already there interchanging greetings and offerings of the contents of their betel boxes faya prom bari brak the chief of the men and kun thao ap chief of the women judges sat apart the latter with her head bowed in an attitude of reflection and sadness before them were low tables on which lay dark rolls of laws siamese paper pens and ink some lower officials and clerks crouched around they all eyed me with curiosity as i entered and took a seat at the end of the hall near the two priests who were present as witnesses but no one made any objection to my stay i had not been there long when a file of amazons appeared bringing in tupton and the two other girls under guard these were Mapran and simla tupton's most intimate friends whom i had always seen with her when she came to the schoolroom but was that tupton i sat stupefied at the transformation that had been wrought in the tupton i had known her hair was cut close to her head and her eyebrows had been shaved off her cheeks were hollow and sunken her eyes were cast down her hands were manacled and her bare little feet could hardly drag along the heavy chains that were fastened to her ankles her scarf was tied tightly over her bosom and under it her close-fitting vest was buttoned up to the throat her whole form was still childlike when she held herself erect and her manner was self-possessed when she spoke her voice was clear and vibrating her accent firm and unflinching the amazons laid before the judges some priest's garments and a small amulet attached to a piece of yellow cord the vestments such as are worn by a name young priest were those in which tupton had been arrested and in which she had probably escaped from the palace the amulet in appearance like those worn by all the natives of the country had been taken from her neck on opening the yellow silk which formed the envelope of the latter a piece of paper was found stitched inside with english letters written thereon kun thao ap was sufficiently versed in english to spell out and read aloud the name of kun fra balap tuptum was then ordered to come forward she dragged herself along as well as she could and took her place in the centre of the hall she made no obeisance no humble appealing prostration but neither was there any want of modesty in her demeanour she sat down with the air of one who suffered but who was too proud to complain i caught a glance of her eyes they were clear and bright and an almost imperceptible melancholy smile flitted across her face as she returned my greeting i was more astonished than before the simple child was transfigured into a proud heroic woman and as she sat there she seemed so calm and pure that one might think she had already crystallized into a lovely statue simla and maprang were examined first 
and without apparent reluctance confessed all that poor tuptum had ever confided to them and a great many other irrelevant matters but when simla spoke of her friend's escape from the palace as connected with Poon fra balat's coming in for alms tuptum interrupted her telling her to stop and saying that's not true you are wrong simla you know nothing about it you know you don't and it was not at that time then as if recollecting herself she added proudly no matter go on never mind me say all that you want to say and resumed her former position well said fire from barirak the chief man judge if your companions know nothing about it perhaps you will tell us exactly how it was if i tell you the whole truth will you believe me and judge me righteously asked the girl you shall have the bastinado applied to your bare back if you do not confess all your guilt at once replied the judge tupton did not speak immediately but by the expression of her eyes and the alternate flushing and paling of her face it was evident that she was debating in her own mind whether she should make a full confession or not finally with an air of fixed determination she turned towards kun thao ap and addressing her exclusively said kun fra balap has not sinned my lady nor is he in any way guilty all the guilt is mine in the stillness of the nights when i prostrated myself in prayer before some detch fra buddha the chow thoughts of escaping from the palace often and often would distract me from my devotions and take possession of my thoughts it seemed to me as if it were the voice of the lord and that there was nothing for me to do but to obey so i dressed myself as a priest shaved off my hair and my eyebrows now interrupted fire from bari rock that's just what we want to hear tell us who it was got the priest's dress for you and shaved off your hair and your eyebrows speak up louder my lord i am telling what i did myself and not what any one else did hear me and i will speak the truth so far as it relates to myself beyond that i cannot go replied tupton a sudden flush covering her face and making her look lovelier than ever go on said the dreadful man with a scornful smile at the childish form before him we shall find a way to make you speak Deknak, she is very young said kun thao ap gently tuptum was silent for some moments the sunlight streaming across the hall fell just behind her revealing the exquisite transparency of her olive-coloured skin as with a look more thoughtful and an expression more serenely simple still she continued at five o'clock in the morning when the priests were admitted into the palace i crawled out of my room and joined the procession as it passed on to receive the royal alms no one saw me but simla and even she as she has told me herself did not recognize me but wondered why a priest came so near to my door that is true broke in simla i never even knew that tuptum had run away until kun ye one of the chief ladies of the harem sent to inquire why she was absent from duty so long and then i began to think that the young priest i had seen had something to do with it but i was afraid to say anything of this to the women who searched the houses lest we should be accused of having helped her to escape when simla had done speaking tupton continued i know not why but when i found myself outside of the palace walls i went straight to the temple of raja ba ditsan and sat down at the gate towards evening the good priest chow kun san came out and on seeing me asked me why i sat there i did not know what else to say and so i begged him to let me be his disciple and live in his monastery whose disciple art thou my child he asked at which i began to cry for i did not wish to deceive the holy man seeing my distress he turned to fra balat who was following him with other priests and bade him take me under his charge and instruct me faithfully in all the doctrines of buddha then fra balat took me to his cell but he did not recognize in the young priest i seemed to be the tuptum he had known in his boyhood and who had once been his betrothed wife at this part of tuptum's recital the women held up their hands in profound astonishment and the men judges grinned maliciously 
displaying their hateful gums red with the juice of the betel nut the poor girl's pale lips quivered and her whole face testified to the immensity of her woe as with simple truthful earnestness she asseverated fra balat whom you have condemned to torture and to death has not sinned he is innocent the sin is mine and mine only i knew that i was a woman but he did not if i had known all that he has taught me since i became his disciple i could not have committed the great sin of which i am accused i would have tried indeed and truly i would have tried to endure my life in the palace and would not have run away oh lady dear believe that i am speaking the truth i grew quiet and happy because i was near him and he taught me every day and i can say the whole of the navadharma divine law by heart you can ask his other disciples who were with me and they will tell you that i was always modest and humble and we all lay at his feet by night indeed dear lady i did not so much want to be his wife after he became a fra priest but only to be near him on sunday morning those men pointing to the two priests who sat apart came to the cell to see fra balat and it so happened that i had overslept myself i had just got up and was arranging my dress thinking that i was alone in the cell when i heard a low chuckling laugh in an instant i turned and faced them and felt that i was degraded for ever believe me dear lady continued tupton growing more and more eloquent as she became still more earnest in her recital i was guilty it is true when i fled from my gracious master the king but i never even contemplated the sin of which i am accused by those men i knew that i was innocent and i begged them to let me leave the temple and hide myself anywhere telling them that fra balat did not know who i was or that i was a woman but they only laughed and jeered at me i fell on my knees at their feet and implored them entreated them in the name of all that is holy and sacred to keep my secret and let me go but they only laughed and jeered at me the more they would not be merciful here the poor girl gasped as if for breath while two large tears coursed down her cheeks and then i defied them and i still defy them she added shaking her manacled hands at them the two priests looked at the girl unmoved chewing their betel all the while the judges listened in silence with an air of amused incredulity as to a fairy tale she continued just then fra balat and his other disciples returned from their morning ablutions i crawled to his feet and told him that i was tupton he started back and recoiled to the end of the cell as if the very earth had quaked beneath him leaving me prostrate and overwhelmed with horror at what i had done in a moment afterwards he came back to me and while weeping bitterly himself begged me that i would cry no more but the sight of his tears and the grief in my heart made me feel as if i were being swallowed up in a great black abyss and i could not help crying more and more then he tried to soothe me and said alas tupton thou hast committed a great sin but fear not we are innocent and for the sake of the great love thou hast shown to me i am ready to suffer even unto death for thee this is the whole truth indeed indeed it is well well said fayoprong barirak you have told your story beautifully but nobody believes you how will you tell us who shaved off your hair and your eyebrows and brought you that priest's dress you had on yesterday the simple grandeur of that fragile child as she folded her chained hands across her bosom as if to still its tumultuous heaving and replied i will not defies all description i had drawn quite near to tupton when she began her simple narrative and was so much absorbed in attention to what she said and in admiration of the fearlessness as well as of the beauty and majesty of that little figure that i had remained rooted to the spot standing there mechanically and hardly noting what was going on around me but the effect of that reply was startling it brought me suddenly to my senses and to a full appreciation of the scene before me there was a child of barely sixteen years hurling defiance at her own risk and peril at the judges who appeared as giants beside her to make such a reply to those executors of siam's cruel laws was not only to accept death but all the agonies of merciless torture 
as her refusal fell like a thunderbolt upon my startled ears she seemed a very titan among the giants strip her and give her thirty blows shouted the infuriated fayaprom barirak in a voice hoarse with passion and kun thou up looked calmly on presently the crowd opened and a litter borne by two men was brought into the hall on it lay the mutilated form of the priest balat who had just undergone the torture in order to make him confess his guilt and that of his accomplice tuptim but as the minutes of the ecclesiastical court stated it had not been possible to elicit from him even an indication that he had anything to confess his priestly robes had been taken from him and he was dressed like any ordinary layman except that his hair and eyebrows were closely shaven they laid him down beside tuptim hoping that the sight of her under torture would induce him to confess the next moment tuptim was stripped of her vest and bound to a stake and the executioners proceeded to obey the orders of the judge when the first blow descended on the girl's bare and delicate shoulders i felt as if bound and lacerated myself and losing all control over my actions forgetting that i was a stranger and a foreigner there and as powerless as the weakest of the oppressed around me i sprang forward and heard my voice commanding the executioners to desist as they valued their lives the amazons at once dropped their uplifted bamboos and why so asked the judge at least till i can plead for tuptim before his majesty i replied so be it said the wretch go your way we will wait your return tuptim was unbound and the moment she was released she crouched down and concealed herself under the folds of the canvas litter in which the priest lay motionless and silent i forced my way through the curious crowd who stood on tiptoe and with necks outstretched trying to get a sight of the guilty pair on leaving the hall i met the slave-girl femme who followed me into the palace wringing her hands and sobbing bitterly the king was in his breakfast hall and the smell of food made me sick and dizzy as i climbed the lofty staircase for i had eaten nothing that day nevertheless i walked as rapidly as possible up to the chair in which the king was seated fearing that i might lose my courage if i deliberated a moment your majesty i began to say in a voice that seemed quite strange to me i beg i entreat your pity on poor tuptim i assure you that she is innocent if you had known from the beginning that she was betrothed to another man you would never have taken her to be your wife she is not guilty and the priest too is innocent oh do be gracious to them and forgive them both i pray your majesty to give me a scrap of writing to say that she is forgiven and that the priest too is pardoned through your goodness only let me my voice failed me and i sank upon the floor by the king's chair i beg your majesty's pardon you are mad said the monarch and fixing a cold stare upon me he burst out laughing in my face i started to my feet as if i had received a blow staggering to a pillar and leaning against it i stood looking at him i saw that there was something indescribably revolting about him something fiendish in his character which had never struck me before and i was seized with an inexpressible horror of the man stupefied and amazed quite as much at finding myself there as at the new development i witnessed thought and speech alike failed me and i turned to go away madam said that man to me come back i have granted your petition and the woman will be condemned to work in the rice mill you need not return to the court house you had better go to the school now i could not thank him the revulsion of feeling was too great i understood him perfectly but i had no power to speak i went away without a word and at the head of the stairs met one of the women judges bringing some papers in her hand to the king instead of going to the school i went home utterly sick and prostrated the king changes his mind about two o'clock that very afternoon i was startled to see two scaffolds set up on the great common in front of my windows opposite the palace a vast crowd of men women and children had already collected from every quarter in order to see the spectacle whatever it might happen to be a number of workmen were driving stakes and bringing up strange machines 
under the hurried instructions of several high siamese officials there was an appearance of great and general excitement among the crowd on the green and i became sufficiently aroused to inquire of my maid what was the reason of all this preparation and commotion she informed me that a barachet guilty priest and a nahar royal concubine were to be exposed and tortured for the improvement of the public morals that afternoon it was afternoon already as i afterwards learned i had no sooner left the king than the woman judge i had met at the head of the staircase laid before him the proceedings of both the trials of ballot and tupton on reading them he repented of his promised mercy flew into a violent rage against tupton and me and not knowing how to punish me except by showing me his absolute power of life and death over his subjects ordered the scaffolds to be set up before my windows and swore vengeance against any person who should again dare to oppose his royal will and pleasure to do justice to the king i must here add that having been educated a priest he had been taught to regard the crime of which tupton and balat were accused as the most deadly sin that could be committed by man the scaffolds or pillories on which the priest and tuptum were to be exposed were made of poles and about five feet high and to each were attached two long levers which were fastened to the neck of the victim and prevented his falling off while they were so arranged as to strangle him in case this was the sentence all the windows of the long antechamber that filled the eastern front of the palace were thrown open and i could see the hurried preparations making for the king the princes and princesses and all the great ladies of the court who from there were to witness the exquisite torture that awaited the hapless tuptum paralyzed by the knowledge that the only person who could have done anything the barbarous cruelty that was about to be perpetrated her britannic majesty's counsel t g knox now counsel general was then absent from bangkok i looked in helpless despair at what was going on before me i longed to escape into the forest or to take refuge with the missionaries who lived several miles down the river but so dense was the crowd and so horrible the idea of deserting poor tupton and leaving her to suffer alone that i felt obliged to stay and sympathize with her and pray for her at the least i thus compelled myself to endure what was one of the severest trials of my life a little before three o'clock the instruments of torture were brought and placed beside the scaffolds soon a long loud flourish of trumpets announced the arrival of the royal party and the king and all his court were visible at the open windows the amazons dressed in scarlet and gold took their post in the turrets to guard the favored fair ones who were doomed to be present and to witness the sufferings of their former companion suddenly the throng sent up a thrilling cry whether of joy or sorrow i could not comprehend and the moment after the priest was hoisted upon the scaffold to the right while tupton tranquilly ascended that to the left nearest my windows i thought i could see that the poor priest turned his eyes full of love and grief towards her i need not attempt to depict the feelings with which i saw the little lady with her hands which were no longer chained folded upon her bosom look calmly down upon the heartless and abandoned rabble who as usual flocked around the scaffold to gloat upon the spectacle and who usually greet with ferocious howls the agonies of the poor tortured victims but on this occasion the rabble were awed into silence while some simple hearts here and there firm believers in tupton's innocence were so impressed by her calm self-possession that they even prostrated themselves in worship of that childish form my windows were closed upon the scene but that tiny figure with her scarlet scarf fluttering in the breeze had so strong a fascination for me that i could not withdraw but leaned against the shutters an unwilling witness of what took place with feelings of pain indignation pity and conscious helplessness which can be imagined two trumpeters one on the right and one on the left 
blared forth the nature of the crime of which the helpless pair were accused ten thousand eyes were fixed upon them but no sound no cry was heard every one held his breath and remained mute in fixed attention in order not to lose a single word of the sentence that was to follow again the trumpet sounded and the conviction of the accused with the judgment that had been passed upon them was announced then the spell was broken and some of the throng as if desirous to propitiate the royal spectator at the window made the air ring with their shouts while others going still further showered all manner of abuse upon the poor girl as she stood calmly awaiting her fate upon those shaking wooden posts nothing could surpass the dignity of demeanour with which the little lady sustained the storm of calumny from the more mercenary of the rabble around her but the rapidity with which the colour came and went in her cheeks which were now of glowing crimson and now deadly pale and the astonishment and indignation which flashed from her eyes showed the agitation within the shrill native trumpets sounded for the third time the multitude was again hushed into a profound silence and the executioners mounted a raised platform to apply the torture to tuptum for one moment it seemed as if the intense agony exceeded her power of endurance she half turned her back upon the royal spectator at the window her form became convulsed and she tried to hide her face in her hands but she immediately raised herself up as by a supreme effort and her voice rang out like a clear deep-toned silver bell chan me defit kun fra balat ko my me fit fra but the chow sat mat she had hardly done speaking when she uttered an agonized cry wild and piercing it was peculiarly touching the cry was that of a child an infant falling from its mother's arms and she fell forward insensible upon the two poles placed there to support her the attendant physicians soon restored her to consciousness and after a short interval the torture was again applied once more her voice rang out more musical still for its quivering vibrations were full of the tenderest devotion the most sublime heroism i have not sinned nor has the priest my lord balat sinned the sacred boat in heaven knows all every torture that would agonize but not kill was employed to wring a confession of guilt from the suffering tuptum but every torture every pang every agony failed utterly and completely failed to bring forth anything but the childlike innocence of that incomparable pagan woman the honour of the priest Bawak seemed inexpressibly more precious to her than her own life for the last words i heard from her were all the guilt was mine i knew that i was a woman but he did not after this i neither heard nor saw anything more i was completely exhausted and worn out and had no strength left to endure further sight of this monstrous this inhuman tragedy kind nature came to my relief and i fainted when i again looked from my window the scaffolds were removed the crowd had departed the sun had set i strained my eyes trying if i could distinguish anything on the great common before the house there was a thick mist loaded with sepulchral vapours a terrifying silence an absolute quiet that made me shudder as if i were entombed alive at last i saw one solitary person coming towards my house through the gathering darkness it was the slave girl Fem, whose life had been saved by the resolute bravery of her mistress for it was she who had bought the priest's dress and aided her mistress to escape from the palace she came to me in secret to tell me that the most merciful and yet the most dreadful doom death by fire which is the punishment assigned by the laws of siam to the crime of which they were accused had been pronounced upon the priest and tuptum by that most irresponsible of human beings the king of siam that they had suffered publicly outside of the moat and wall which enclosed the cemetery wat sa ke 
and that some of the common people had been terribly affected by the sight of the priest's invincible courage and of tuptum's heroic fortitude with her low massive brow her wild glistening eyes and her whole soul in her face she spoke as if she still beheld that fragile form in its last struggle with the flaming fire that wrapped it round about and still heard her beloved mistress's voice as she confronted the populace holding up her mutilated hands and saying i am pure and the priest my lord Ballant, is pure also see these fingers have not made my lips to lie the sacred both in heaven judge between me and my accusers the slave girl's grief was as deep and lasting as her gratitude every seventh day she offered fresh flowers and odoriferous tapers upon the spot where her mistress and the priest had suffered firmly believing that their disembodied souls still hovered about the place at twilight bewailing their cruel fate she assured me that she often heard voices moaning plaintively through the mellow evening air growing deeper and gathering strength as she listened and seeming to draw her very soul away with them now tenderly weeping now fervently exulting until they became indistinct and finally died away in the regions of the blessed and the pure i afterwards learned that the fickle populace convinced of the innocence of balat and tuptum would have taken speedy vengeance on the two priests their accusers had they not escaped from bangkok to a monastery at Paknam, and that the twenty catis offered for the capture of tuptum had been expended in the purchase of yellow robes earthen pots pillows and mats for the use of the bonzes at wat raja ba ditsan no priest being allowed to touch silver or gold the name balat which signifies wonderful had been given to the priest by the high priest chao kun sa because of his deep piety and his intuitive perception of divine and holy truths the name which his mother bestowed upon him and by which tuptim had known him in her earlier years was dang because of his complexion which was a golden yellow on being bereft of tuptim to whom he was tenderly attached he entered the monastery and became a priest in order that by austere devotion and the study of the divine law he might wean his heart from her and distract his mind from the contemplation of his irreparable loss for more than a month after tuptim's sad death i did not see the king at last he summoned me to his presence and never did i feel so cold so hard and so unforgiving as when i once more entered his breakfast hall he took no notice of my manner but as soon as he saw me began with what was uppermost in his mind i have much sorrow for tuptim he said i shall now believe she is innocent i have had a dream and i had a clear observation in my vision of tuptim and balat floating together in a great wide space and she has bent down and touched me on the shoulder and said to me we are guiltless we were ever pure and guiltless on earth and look we are happy now after discoursing thus she has mounted on high and vanished from my further observation i have much sorrow ma'am much sorrow and respect for your judgment but our laws are severe for such a crime but now i shall cause monument to be erected to the memory of balat and tuptim any one who may now pass by watsa kate will see two tall and slender fra chades or obelisks erected by order of the king on the spot where those lovely buddhists suffered each bearing this inscription suns may set and rise again but the pure and brave balat and tuptim will never more return to this earth End of the king changes his mind End of tuptim's trial by anna leon owens